Welcome to CS252. Um, I'm Chris Rosanovich. I'll be your lecturer this semester. Um, so today's lecture, we're really just going to uh, do an introduction. So we're just going to go through what we're going to be doing in 252 and also the course structure for the main part. I also have a surprise pop quiz for you. You're going to love that um, in here. So, so don't all disappear out the door. Uh, so you know, welcome to the class. Um, so this is a really exciting time for computer architecture, right? It always seems to be an exciting time, but especially so right now. Um, and this means it's a terrifying time if you actually use computers, because um, things are changing uh, a lot. Um, so the big upheaval really is, you know, for the last 50 years, every architecture class would start with a nice chart of Moore's Law and these graphs that go up and to the right in a log scale. Um, and they stop going up and to the right. They kind of flattened out. So the big... Um, the big change is this technology scaling isn't really working anymore. So we got down to these tiny, tiny transistors, and we're down to, you know, in production we're shipping 14 nanometer technology. And it turns out that 14 nanometer, most people think, is actually more expensive per transistor than the preceding nodes, 20 and 28 nanometer. And Moore's Law is all about the cost per transistor. So with the amazing thing that's happened, why computers everywhere, why I can have cheap cameras or whatever, is that transistors got cheaper. And they got cheaper because we made them smaller, we built these big fabrication plants that made ever more transistors. The cost went down. People used computers everywhere. Um, but Moore's Law, um, what Moore's Law was really about was how many transistors can you put on a chip at the lowest cost per transistor point. And that's what's happened now is that it's kind of stopped because you can go down, you can put more on a chip, but it costs you more per transistor. So only certain application areas can you really justify uh, going down there. So this is a big change. And it's been happening over the last four or five years. It's sort of been slowing down, but now it's sort of come to a juddering halt. Um, and so if you want more performance improvement, it's not going to come just by waiting for the process guys to make you give you smaller transistors that are better. You kind of have to work above the transistor level, which involves the, the architects going to have to do this, because otherwise the software guys will have to do it. That's even harder to get them to change stuff. Um, so other things that happened previously was we have been dropping supply voltage, but that couldn't drop any lower because if we dropped it lower, we'd have to drop a threshold voltage, which is when the transistor turns on, and that would cause a lot of leakage. And so you kind of got constrained in how low you could put the supply voltage, and that meant that power became a bigger issue because we weren't able to scale voltage down like we did before. Um, and the other big worry really is there's no replacement for CMOS anytime soon. So CMOS is the technology we use to build all the chips, and it's amazing technology. So you can get you know billions of transistors on a single chip, and what's even more impressive, you can wire them together. You can actually connect them together with many layers of wiring. Some chips have up to 17 layers of metal wiring on top to connect all the transistors together. And you can do that, billions of transistors connected by you know, billions of wires and running at multiple gigahertz. And then you can sell the chip for a few bucks, like eight to 10 bucks a chip for something complicated like that. That's just incredible technology. That's what enables all this stuff around us. Um, it's so good though that all these, you know, if you read these science articles about some new amazing, you know, quantum device or something, they are so far away from competing with this mature technology that's going to be maybe 20, 30 years before there's anything better than current CMOS. So we're complaining about CMOS stopping, scaling, slowing down, but all the other WISO devices you read about, none of them are anywhere near close to that capability that we have in CMOS technology. So it's basically going to be CMOS technology zip, you know, plus some may maybe sprinkles on top to make it a little bit better for the next bunch of years. Um, that's what we're going to have to live with. And also because the scaling has stopped, energy efficiency constrains everything. You can't just keep increasing compute because if the energy per operation doesn't go down, your power is going to go up. So uh, that's really a big, a big issue. Um, and you know, although you know, hardware guys work hard to um, accommodate software guys' desire to do nothing uh, much, um, you, you know, there's no free lunch for software developers. Software has to really worry about, you're already seeing this, have to worry about parallel systems, you have to worry about heterogeneous systems as well. Okay, so one, in talking about architecture, it's really important, and this will be a theme in the class, is to, uh, to understand how things are used, what the markets are. You know, you can't study architecture in a vacuum. It's kind of meaningless unless you think about where, where is it getting used, what's the target systems. So if you look today where, you know, microprocessors are used, um, you can break it down in these different areas. So um, you know, uh, the big one now is mobile, um, so by that I include smartphone and tablet. And we're basically selling, people are buying about one and a half billion uh, phones a year. Um, and if you think about that, there's only sort of seven billion people on the planet. So 
every you know, two to three years, you know, people are replacing their phones. And that kind of gets you at this you know, couple of billion per year for these, these phones and tablets. And tablets are replacing less often. That's been a problem now. The tablet market is saturating. You know, and even Apple's having trouble selling iPads because they, they last too long. You know, they're, they're fine. They want to replace them, right? Um, phones also, it's going to slow down. And so these are actually, I would consider a smartphone and tablet now. It was the hot area a few years ago, but now it's kind of saturating, you know. You know, at a very healthy level of a couple billion a year, but um, there's not going to be a massive growth there. Um, so if you actually look at what's happening in the smartphone tablet, you know, 99.9% .9 of all the phones, the smartphones are based on the ARM uh, ISA, processors that are compatible with the ARM ISA. Um, and they're implemented with these systems on a chip, so every chip has a few ARM cores on and a whole bunch of other accelerators and widgets on there. Um, things to handle the radio, to do image processing, video graphics. Um, all this is on this one chip. Um, the other extreme is sort of warehouse scale computers. This is sort of the cloud, the machines in the cloud. So these machines, you know, in the warehouse, we'll talk about those later, you'll have hundreds of thousands of cores, millions of cores in a warehouse. Uh, and this market's really, again, like 99% dominated by uh, x86 uh, compatible chips. Um, and actually, also you know, over 90% of those are from Intel. Um, there's some dedicated apps. For example, Google Search is an app they wrote to run on their massive cluster. But there's also a lot of uh, cloud hosting of virtual machines. So uh, Amazon resells their cloud computing capacity in the form of virtual machines. Anybody can go along and buy a seat in the cloud, you know, an instance that runs out in Amazon's machine on top of their servers. Um, so this is sort of kind of current state of the art. What you're starting to see in even in the cloud offerings is now you can buy instances that have GPUs attached, graphics processing units that do data parallel computing. Um, and you're starting even starting to see FPGAs in uh, some cloud-based applications. So Microsoft is deploying FPGAs to accelerate their Bing search engine, for example. But mostly it's just general purpose servers and many, many, many of them uh, in this warehouse scale. Now this is kind of the, these two markets I would say are dominated, you know, the, the some of the primary concerns are providing a platform for which you can run software developed elsewhere. So in the Apple case, you have the you know, App Store, right? You have the App Store, millions of apps developed by lots of people running that phone. So if you buy a phone, you buy software from somebody else to run that phone, right? So that's a you know, example of what I would call a general purpose platform. Third party software is bought and sold for that platform. Um, a lot of consequences to that will go over. The main one being that you really worry about supporting the platform stably, making sure it's compatible, so developers know what they're writing code for, and uh, implementers of the machines know what they're supposed to build. In embedded computing, um, I'm gonna categorize embedded computing as all the software that runs in it kind of is written by the, the people who sell you the box, right? You buy a box, it has a bunch of processes in there, has a bunch of code running on there, but basically you don't change it over time. Like, it's rare that you'll go and, um, you know, buy a third-party app for your thermostat. You know, this may change um, over time, but right now, a lot of these applications and, you know, many, many processes are hidden in devices where you never know that there's a processor there so, and there's no app store or anything to buy uh, code for that. Um, so, you know, some examples of things like, you know, wired and wireless network infrastructure, like routers, base stations, um, uh, printers. There's a big market for processors inside printers. Um, a lot of consumer, you know, TV, uh, a lot of processors in TVs. Uh, music players, radios, in your car, there's a lot of processors in a car. That's actually one of the dominant uh, consumers of individual processors now. A modern day car may have dozens, like 100 microprocessors in. Um, and, you know, cameras, digital cameras. And this big buzz phrase is Internet of Things, which is, you know, kind of just a buzz phrase. It means, you know, all the other stuff we don't really understand, you know, it's all out there. Um, but you would put that in carry embedded, embedded computing, most of it. Um, sometimes you'll see people call a phone an example of embedded computing device. And I find that a little odd to me. There's pieces of the phone that are definitely embedded, like the radio processor. You know, you never get to touch that. In fact, the FCC requires that it's certified with a certain code running on there, and you're not allowed to change it. So they take great lengths to make sure you can't get at the code that runs on those things. But the sort of ARM general purpose processor, that's something you buy apps for, right? You buy a, um, an app to do something on that phone. And that's definitely, to me, not an embedded processor. You're very much aware it's a computer because you can write buy software for it and even get development kids to write your own software for that platform, right? Okay. Um, so in 2.52, um, the way I want to try and help you understand computer architecture is sort of through these different dimensions. Um, one is history. And we do, we'll actually do a, a long trawl through computer architecture history. 
um, applications, what do people use these things for? Technology trends. Um, you know, one way of thinking about computer architecture is we have to figure out, given the technology and the applications people want to do, how do you bridge that gap? How do you make the technology do the things people want it to do? Um, so in looking at the solutions people have come up with, we'll talk about architectural design patterns. These are what are the styles of computer architecture that just recur all the time? So, you know, there's like half a dozen, you know, a dozen or so classic architecture styles, and almost any new proposal you'll see for computer architecture is based on one of those, right? So these have been around for a long time, um, worked on for a long time. They just get mixed up in seemingly new ways, but it's it's important to understand the fundamentals behind these architectures. Um, then going along with those patterns that are programming models, which are the standard ways people have evolved to program each of those types of uh, architecture. Another important thing is business models, like is when does it make sense to, to, to develop these things? So let's sort of dive through this a bit more. So I'm a big fan of using history to study architecture, um, uh, and we're going to do that in this class. And part of it is to appreciate the rich architecture law. There's a lot of things, that if you are unaware of the history, you will not understand some of the things architects say. You have to understand the, you know, this historical context, where things came from, why certain machines are always referred to, why, why was that machine important? So I think we're going to go back and look at that. Um, also help you understand where we are today, uh, why things are the way they are, because if you were to start from scratch, you would not end up with what we have today. <laughs> There's this long historical legacy that has influenced everything that, that's here. And some of this is um, you know, based on applications in the past, technology in the past, a lot of it's just based on business decisions in the past, or business concerns. Also, filling in the architecture history will help you write better, you know, related work sections in your research papers. There's a common phenomena that, you know, often new researchers, new graduate students write papers that have like three years of related work. You know, basically the last few years of major conferences, but, you know, the history goes back to the, you know, Second World War, basically. So, you know, a long time ago, 70 years or so of history, and even more, actually. But, um, so the other reason you study history is that, uh, you know, as architects, if you don't learn about history, you're just going to repeat all the same mistakes. And in computer architecture, this is very, very true. And if you look at what happened, every time there was a new scale of machine, people sort of reinvented all their architectural ideas, and they also recreated all the same mistakes because they didn't, you know, I guess they didn't understand the history. So. A lot of the things that people got wrong when they started doing mainframe designs, the early mainframe designs, were kind of repeated when they built mini computers and repeated again when they did microprocessors. And probably get repeated again as you go to some nanoprocessor or whatever. So it's important to understand those mistakes. And, um, you know, occasionally people that have very good reasons for thinking that this time around this won't be a mistake, but usually it is. Um, so we should learn about that. Another important reason I like to study history is that a lot of the revolutionary ideas you hear about are really just rehashings and reorganizations of older ideas. So, you know, you should, you know, the goal is as you become architecture researchers, you should understand all these histor historical ideas, the standard patterns. When you see a new proposal, you should be able to figure out how it fits in that old scheme, and, uh, and you should be able to instantly figure out all the pros and cons of that proposal, because a lot of this stuff has been uh, worked on for a long time. Um, Another thing is actually that a lot of, when things went wrong, uh, people don't publish a lot about it. So negative results don't usually appear. So what you'll hear about is, you know, well if you read the old papers, they'll talk about the new exciting computer architecture idea. And you think, wow, it's a great idea. Why didn't it ever catch on? They won't tell you why it never caught on because you don't write papers about failures usually. And so all that happens is occasionally every 10, 20 years, people say, I have this great idea. Why don't we do it this way? And if you go back, it's the same as a 20 year old idea. People rethink it, still think it's a great idea because you never get that, that back pressure saying, that's a really bad idea. Don't do it that way for these reasons, right? So we'll try and cover that, and I'll come up in the discussions in the class. Now, one thing, you know, I, I'm a little jaded because I've uh, done this for a long time, but sometimes things do change. So applications technology can make what has always historically been a bad, bad idea now become a, new I a good idea, right? So you know, be wary of this, too. Um, so... That's history. So applications, how are we going to look at applications? Well, you know, the only reason we have computers is to run applications, right? They're kind of cool by themselves, but <laughs> if you're an architect, you might be fascinated by a computer. But most people, they're just a, a, a means to an end, right? And that ends running the applications. Um, and as an architect, you should understand the needs of uh, current and future applications. What do they actually need to do? 
um, what, what is common, you know, things. If you design a machine based around what you imagine the application needs, you'll probably be a failure. So um, figure out what the applications need. Um, one, th one problem with studying applications is the real applications are very complex, um, and they include a lot of stuff. Even if the application code seems simple, the way that interacts with standard libraries, the operating system, tends to make the behavior complex. Um, so, um, and another th important thing is applications don't just magically appear, they are written by humans, and it's important to understand how the applications get developed over time. So, um, you know, how, how do developers think about writing applications? How do they, you know, with a machine in mind, how are they going to develop the code? And a common mistake architects maze is, makes is they overestimate how excited software developers are going to be about pouring, you know, all their code to your, you know, funky new idea, right? Um, so, uh, sort of think about what's the, what's the way an uh, application developer is going to move over to this new, new idea. Um, looking at applications in the architecture world, when doing research, a lot of academic research and a lot of even industry research, you know, because it's so hard to look at complex applications, people try and narrow things down with things like benchmark suites or small kernels um, and use those to replace the actual applications and studies. Um, sometimes, though, if you're not very careful, they can have very co poor correlation to what was actually observed with real application behavior. Um, so it's important to understand the limitations of any workloads you do. And this is, a, you know, this is one of the things that's very hard to do the right thing, and even, you know, ideally, if you're a customer buying a computer, you would say, I want the computer that runs my set of applications the best, right? But nobody's going to spend the time evaluating your particular set of applications and designing a processor for you, right? So you're going to look at a general population of users and design code for all of them. Um, and how you build those workloads is a, is a topic of study in itself, right? So it's very difficult to really understand how well you're doing. Uh, looking at applications. Um, so technology trends. So this is a, has been a very important part of computer architecture. Um, things move very fast in computer architecture. Um, so even though there's been this long history, the technology has been changing constantly. So we've had you know, many, many decades of exponential growth. And so you're constantly thinking of not you know, designing a machine for today, but by the time you finish the design, what's the technology look like? So you might just have saw recently an announcement from uh, Intel and Micron about a new non-volatile memory technology. Um, things coming along that might replace NAND flash. A lot of people, including us, looking at integrated silicon photonics. And a lot of work in 3D stacking and new packaging. All these things are going to change how we build computers. But one interesting thing is how applications and technology feed on each other. So they're not developed in isolation. Um, there's a sort of virtuous circle between applications and technologies. So if you know, so a new technology comes along that can enable new applications. So when the microprocessor, the single chip computer came about, that kind of enabled you to have personal computers. And having personal computers enabled applications like VisiCalc, right? So spreadsheets only became possible because of the microprocessor, right? Because you couldn't dedicate enough time on a shared mainframe to run an interactive graphical user interface. So the availability of a single chip microprocessor enabled spreadsheets, and that was the birth of personal computing. Um, uh, the other way around, once you have a popular application, people are paying money to the machines that run that application, and that revenue stream enables you to develop technology further. So, example is flash memory. So NAND flash was originally there. The big initial market was actually in uh, MP3 players, and then digital cameras, right? So there was a you know game-changing thing to have this non-volatile storage. Didn't have to be super fast, it just had to be non-volatile and pretty dense to put an MP3 player or a camera. And based on the revenue they got from this, Flash has evolved a lot. And so now you have SSD drives and you have, you know, multi-petabyte storage arrays build a Flash in data centers, right? Um, but this came from, you know, people wanted to listen to music while they were jogging, right? So you needed a Flash memory. So that, that you know, that the application is really popularity application funds the technology development. The technology gets developed towards those applications. Right. So uh, the flip side of this is if nobody cares about your the application you develop a technology for, you're not going to get any funding to push that technology further, right? So, you know, this also shapes what actually happens in reality. So architectural design patterns. So these are the you know, we talk through the standard ways people build computers. And there's over time, it's kind of distilled down into certain classes of machine. Um, 
And like I said, if you understand how people do this for processors, interconnect memory systems, um, you'll kind of understand any random machine people throw at you, you can just you can learn to break it down into the standard patterns and that'll give you a good understanding of wha what to look for for strengths and weaknesses. Um, so we won't in this class, we won't dive all the way down to the lowest levels of you know, building you know, uh, all the kinds of interconnect. That's more like a CS250 kind of topic, diving down into the uh, sort of RTL level design. Um, but we're going to um, look at some real machines and sort of think about those in terms of how they break down into these uh, standard architectural patterns. So some examples um, the way I think about machines, so microcoding versus pipelining versus decoupling, in order router water superscalers, SIMD, you know, all those various incarnations, VLIW, multi threading, ways of designing the memory system, ways of designing message passing systems or shared memory systems, how protection security virtual machines are implemented, networking and NICs, the storage of the device interfaces. These are sort of standard patterns that show up. Um, we'll go through the standard ways people build these as we go through the class. Each of the standard ways of building the architecture usually has you know, I implications to how you're going to program it, how you're going to think about this machine when you program it. And what you'll find is a lot of the you know, different programming languages have features in that were targeting a given kind of architecture. And they kind of naturally go together well. And the converse of that is when you try and use the wrong programming language for the, a different architectural model, it doesn't always go so well. Right? Um, so you know, a lot of unit processes basically developed around through languages like C, um, and actually very specifically C for things like you know, the RISC workstations. So, um, you know, serial code for unit processes is an obvious one. Um, when the vector machines uh, sort of came about in the 70s, they were designed to take Fortran code, which was, you know, full of loop nests. And so the sort of vector architectures evolved to be good at running that kind of loop nest heavy Fortran code, right? And, it's, and actually Fortran got better at in ways to make it easier to program the vector machines that way. Um, as the shared memory multiprocessors, as microprocessors got cheaper and we started having, you know, um, multiple microprocessors in the system, people started looking at different shared memory programming models. And so the end result of that right now is the modern version of that is OpenMP, um, where you basically annotate loops that split it across shared memory multiprocessors, right? Um, GPUs um, have become popular over the last bunch of years. Uh, and a particular style of program them has evolved from the shader languages used in graphics. And so kind of translating that into more general purpose, well, the idea of writing a little bit of code for each element in an array, and that's captured in these languages, CUDA and OpenCL, which is the CUDA's NVIDIA's proprietary language, OpenCL's an industry standard language for doing the same thing. Um, when you talk about clusters that pass messages, there are standard message passing languages, and MPI is uh, the, the modern uh, way of programming uh, a, a parallel application that uses message passing. Um, and if you go down even to embedded systems, they have their own set of programming models that map to embedded system design. So for example, uh, a lot of distributed embedded systems are based on um, sort of formalism called CSP, communicating sequential processes, or CARM process networks. And there's languages that kind of embody that style of uh, processing, such as Occam for uh, CSP style systems, right? So there's special you know, languages down in the embedded world as well. Okay. Um, okay, so business models. So, you know, the viability of computer designs depends a lot on the expected business model. And as we go through the history, you'll see how things really change because in the old days, you know, selling 10 computers was a success, right? Uh, 10 instances of a machine, right? And these days, you know, you're looking at tens of millions to hundreds of millions uh, or maybe billions of units of a given design, right? That's the high, high volume designs, but still, you know, people are still shipping hundreds of certain kinds of machine, like big supercomputers, right? Um, and th the big factor here is as, as technology has improved and we've got so many more transistors on a chip, the cost to design a chip has just skyrocketed. You need, you know, so many more engineers to actually complete a design when you have a billion transistors on a chip. And typically you'll see something like 10 to $50 million to develop a new complex um, custom chip. Right? If it costs $50 million to develop a chip and you're only going to sell you know, 50 of them, like it's a million dollars worth of uh, NRE per instance that you have to recover in the price, right? So you can't sell it for anywhere less than you know, multiple millions to make any profit, right? Um, versus if, you know, it costs you $50 million to develop a chip and you're going to sell 100 million, it's only 50 cents worth of NRE on that chip. But even that is a significant cost. So what you'll find is a lot of companies, like for example, Nokia used to make chips for their cell phones. 
but even Nokia at their volumes decided it wasn't worthwhile and they sort of closed down their own chip making business and still bought chips in from other people for their cell phones, right? So even at that scale, you know, um, you know, $50 million is a lot of money, right? E and it, these chips are you know, only worth like five, 10 bucks each. So even 50 million, if you're selling uh, uh, 100 million, right, which is a lot, 10 million is pretty good. So 50 million selling 10 million, that's five bucks a chip in NRE. Right, so that's a very, very significant thing you have to worry about in any kind of custom chip design. Um, another thing to consider in business models is the idea of horizontal versus vertical business models. What people mean here is horizontal is where, if you think of the layers of the system stack, horizontal model is where one company takes care of everything up to some level, and then other companies take care of the higher levels. So the classic example is Wintel. Like Intel, those are the processors for PCs. Uh, Windows, Microsoft Windows runs on top of them. And Windows will run on anything that's compatible with x86. And in the horizontal market, the big problems are just ensuring you're really compatible. So Intel spends a lot of money after they design the chip making sure it's actually x86 compatible because the problem is they don't actually have a spec for the x86 because the spec is inherent in the what the applications think an x86 is because there's no formal spec. They basically do a chip, get all the popular applications, make sure they actually work right on that silicon. But there's no way ahead of time of knowing that because there's no spec, and they don't know what's inside Windows, really. So uh, this whole process called post-silicon validation, where they figure out if you know, their view of an x86 actually matches what everybody else does. And this is very important when they start adding lots of optimizations in the microarchitecture, that they think are valid, but who knows, somebody at Microsoft or somewhere else may have had different thoughts, and if it's a really important application, they will have to uh, change the chip. Um, this isn't, well, I'll give you a little anecdote, this isn't quite a functional example, but I did hear about in the Pentium 4 where they um, had a very good branch predictor that did really well on, they have a set of like 2,000 traces they used at the time to evaluate the processor. So 2,000 traces, you know, on 1,997 of them, things went better with this branch predictor, but on three of them it got worse, right? Um, unfortunately, one of those was Excel. So <laughs> they had to go back and change the branch predictor, right? So in a later stepping. So um, that's just a functional example. Perform uh, that wasn't a functional example. It was still correct. It was just performance hit. Um, but it's an example of in the horizontal market. You know, you're producing something that other people are using. Unless that interface is very well defined, you have these issues, right? And even if it is well defined, it's, it's challenging to verify your chip meets that uh, interface spec. Now, increasingly, we're seeing a lot of vertical models where things are more embedded. And they have a bit more freedom in that you know, one company controls the whole stack. Say, for example, Apple, a lot of their products, you know, they design the chips, they write the software that runs on top of it, and maybe nobody else sees, you know, or only see a very small part of that whole system. And they have the luxury of if there's a bug in the core or something, you can work around it in software, nobody knows about it, right? So it's a much more uh, relaxed environment in some ways. Uh, on the other hand, it's much, the horizontal market, you can just mass produce things that are used by many people. In the vertical market, you have to make sure that vertical is big enough to justify doing the custom thing, right? Um, okay. All right, so that was just a general outlay, just to give you some idea of kind of how we're going to look at architecture. Um, now I'm going to spend a bunch of time um, going over the course structure. Uh, so how are we going to do the course this semester? Um, well, first of all, the goals of the class. So really the goals, uh, there's a bunch of goals. One is, well the main goals is give background for people who are going to take the architecture oral prelim. Um, uh, get grad students ready to do research in computer architecture. Um, and for people who are not in architecture but related areas, so if you're interested in you know, operating systems, compilers, networking, high performance programming, uh, this should give you a good background in what's actually going on inside the machine so you can do that. So that's kind of the where the class is aimed at. Um, the prereqs, so I assume you've done an upper div grad architecture class. So upper div, upper division graduate. <laughs> yeah, I think it should be, yeah. Yeah, though uh, 152 is pretty uh, advanced, so. Um, yeah, upper div architecture class, uh, like 152. You should be thoroughly familiar with the idea of an ISA, an assembly programming, um, in-order pipelining and caches. You should have at least seen some of these other things. You should have seen some out-of-order superscalar, some vectors, some PLIW, some multi-threading, so you kind of have some idea what the material is. We're gonna be going through this, these in the class, uh, but if you've never seen it before, none of this stuff, you probably have a really hard time keeping up in the class, right? So those are the prereqs. 
And um, so now I'm going to do a little prereq pop quiz. And this is doesn't count for your grade. This is partly a self-assessment. It's partly for me to get a sense of where the class is. So I'll just give you a 10 minute right now in class multiple choice quiz. Right. Okay, so um, let's sort of dive in with more about what how the class is going to be run this semester. Um, so grades, there's kind of four major components to the class. There's going to be um, reading assignments and summaries. So you'll be reading a lot of papers. Um, a new thing this semester, I'm going to be adding, giving you problem sets. Um, the problem sets are meant to, uh, well I'll go over these each point, each of these things in detail. That'll be a new thing this semester. Then the midterm exam, and then the course project, which will be a major part of the class. Um, so reading assignments. Um, so you're going to be reading a lot of papers. And so um, these are classic old architecture papers, and these are basically must-reads. Like, you, you know, if you're a computer architect, you have to have read these papers, a lot of them. Um, and there's going to be roughly two per class. Um, they're already all up and online, so you can get started anytime you want going through them. Do them chronologically. Um, that's they've been laid out, so a lot of you'll find the later papers refer to the earlier ones. Um, um, so every class will require that you do a two or three hundred word review of those papers. Um, so I think and oh, I forgot to introduce Adam. Adam is a TA for the class, so <laughs> he'll be your point of contact for lots of things. Um, uh, so he's created a Google Forms. Google Forms, right? This Right. So you can, you know, you do it in your text that and cut and paste into the box on the form and submit it. Um, so you have to do it by before midnight, the night before class, to give us a little bit of time to look at them before class. Um, and the reason we have you do the review is because in the class we're going to spend a bunch of time, 20, 30 minutes a class or more maybe, doing discussion of those papers. And previous years people found that one of the more valuable parts of the class, um, to really understand what's going on. Um, so. And to help with a good discussion, I'm going to go around and call upon students. So you have to participate in the class discussion. I'll you know, go around one by one and uh, ask you stuff. Um, and part of this is you're going to be training for being a grad student in architecture, and in particular taking your prelim. You have to be comfortable with talking about computer architecture right, to people. That's part of the training. So um, we'll be doing that. It should hopefully be fun as well. Um, like I said, all the papers are already up and online on the website, so you can see the whole list and you can get going anytime, right? But there's the assignments for every class and send so, so the reviews in uh, uh, the night before. So the review, what you should be doing is reviewing this as if you were on a program committee at that point in time, which is a little hard to, you know, send yourself back to the 1950s and say, what did they think about? Oh, you say, well, this is old. This has been done many times before. But you got to think in the context of the 1950s. What was good about it? What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? Um, what did you like about it? What did you not like about it? Um, all things to, to put down in that review. Um, okay, so that's the reading assignments and summaries. Um, problem sets. So they'll be once a week, um, most, most weeks, not every week. Um, they'll be assigned on the Monday, and then they'll be due the Sunday before the Monday class the following week. Um, and these have to be done individually, no collaboration. Um, and they're designed to make you think about architecture and to help you get ready for the oral prelim. And also give you some idea what the midterm questions might look like. So I think one of the bugs last time is we just gave the midterm without giving people a lot of prep. Um, and it's easy to read a lot. So one, one thing I've, I've learned is it's very easy to read a lot of architecture, think you understand it. But as soon as you ask somebody a question that changes things a little bit, you realize you don't actually understand it at all. So the point of the problem set is to make you think and see, you know, uh, if you really get it, um, uh, the architecture stuff. Um, another thing with computer architecture, uh, it's not like math or anything else. Often the quest, there's no single correct answer, right? You just have to show you have a valid way of reasoning that seems uh, as good, uh, and so justify your thinking uh, when working through these problems. Um, so the first simple one will be out today. This one, first one isn't really a uh, big problem set. It's just to make you think about the machines around you. Um, and I think, so I forget what was the format of sending this one out. There's also the Google Forms, so. Okay, so where would people go to get this? So on the course website, you click on, I think, info, or course info, and then it leads you to the thing that just tells you all about the problem sets. If you click on a link there, it'll take you to the where you can submit your problem set. Okay, yes, yeah, so the first one is kind of more like the prereq quiz. It's just some standard things you, you have to answer, then just 
go look at a machine around you and fill in all these details about a real machine that you're familiar with. Um, okay, that's just a s simple dry run, basically, of our machinery of doing the problem sets as much as anything else. Um, so that'll be due on Sunday, this Sunday coming up. Uh, the midterm, um, that'll be 30% of the grade. This will be an uh, in class midterm, so just I in this room uh, during a regular class time. We'll just cover all the lecture material, the readings, uh, problem set stuff. Um, notionally, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday, October 28th, but we might shift that. It might go a week later, actually. Um, yeah, the way I always do exams, closed book, no, no notes, no nothing. Um, and the, the goal is the exam is designed, so it's not a memorization test. So if you need to know anything, it'll be in the quiz. Um, there is to test your understanding. Um, so you won't need any um, cheat sheets or anything like that. It'll just be uh, closed book, no notes, no nothing. Right. Um, the course project is a big part of the class. So this is the more fun part of the class. Uh, the idea is students should work in groups of two um, to work on a project. And the topic should be anything that might appear at a top architecture conference that in terms of what kind of material is appropriate for a project. Um, We'll want a two-page proposal by early October, um, so you know, sort of six or s seven weeks from now, six weeks from now or so. Um, and actually, what we can do is the, the class is structured, so there's lectures up until, so the first half or two-thirds of the class has lectures and discussions, and then towards the end, we just move to a one-on-one -on -one, uh, model for project meetings, so we'll you know, in the class times during that week, we'll split it up into slots for the different project groups, and I'll, we'll just meet with you to go over the, the project, so help you get the project finished, right? So move to project advising in the, during the class slots in the second half of the semester. Um, so you do the projects, we'll do the one-on-one -on -one advising the projects, and the final presentation will be in uh, RRR week. We'll have to figure out a room and time, but sometime in there we'll do the final presentations, and the whole class should come to the, the whole the, all the presentations. Um, and then the final paper will be due um, uh, towards the end of that, that period. Um, so the final paper should be PDF format, has to be PDF, nothing else. Um, conference format, so you know, sort of 10 pages, up to 10 pages, two column format. So it should look like a regular conference paper. It's your end of uh, semester course project paper. And there's absolutely no extensions. So if you don't get it done, you have to take it incomplete, basically. It's the only way you get an extension. Incomplete, I guess, is the one way of getting an extension. So, <laughs> <laughs> right, uh, basically, because we have to turn the grades in right after that. Um, any questions on any of this so far? No. Nope. Okay. Um, so, for the projects, a good project proposal um, needs a title <laughs> and two authors' names at least, um, and then you should answer these questions. These are the classic Halmeyer questions. Um, uh, like, what are you trying to do? It's a good thing to have at the start of your proposal. People often admit that. What are you actually trying to do? How is it currently done? Right? Or what's been tried before? Uh, what's the potential upside if you're successful? Like, what's the biggest gain you could possibly imagine from this thing you're proposing to do? Um, and how are you going to evaluate your idea? How are you going to know it's better than or different than you know, what somebody else has done? Another important thing for uh, the class project is what's your intermediate milestones? Like, you know, how did you know you're making progress? I, have you got any, can you see the small steps that are going to get you to the end, uh, big end result? Like saying, you know, in this class I'm going to design a, you know, 10 million core supercomputer, you know, fabricated, and, you know, it's not going to happen in, you know, the time frame of this project, so you have to have something realistic. Um, uh, an important thing is the infrastructure you're going to use to do this. So one thing in this class is we don't have standard labs, we don't have standard infrastructure. You know, this is a grad class, so you, your goal is to seek out and find the infrastructure you're going to use to do your do your project, right? And there's, you know, there's we can talk about this. There's resources around. There's a lot of in the computer architecture group. There's a lot of stuff you can play with, processor designs and code if you want to go do that. There's also out in the real world, out the outside Berkeley, <laughs> the real world. <laughs> uh, we live in this nice bubble, but outside there's also. Uh, a lot of architecture simulators of various kinds and flavors. There's also real machines, a lot of real machines to play with <coughs> if you're doing more of an analysis project. Um, so I think a big, a big part of a successful project is knowing what infrastructure you're going to use. It's, it's, you know, having a great idea but not knowing how you're going to actually do it. Um, so I think you know, it, it's not too early to start teaming up, finding a project partner, finding some ideas, and looking for what you might use as the infrastructure because that's usually the the infrastructure is what takes most of the time in any of these. Having the ideas is easy. Right? Anybody can have ideas, right? 
figuring out whether they're any good or not means building a whole evaluation infrastructure and trying things out. That's what takes all the time. Um, so that's that's important uh, thing to get going on. Um, so the class website um, is where everything is going to be posted. So let's do a quick uh, shift over to that. So the uh, another important thing is um, we'll be using Piazza for the class communication. So you should sign up on Piazza. Just follow the link and sign up for that. Um, so here's the uh, the schedule of the readings. So these are the you know it's basically two. Some of the where you have three readings, this like some of these are very short, like one or two pages of of stuff. Um, a few of the papers are exceedingly long. Um, um, yeah, what I didn't mention was there are a couple of slip days, but uh, for example, uh, this one is a very long paper, but a very solid paper about, it's all about how VMware works, you know, the via virtualization layer for x86 platforms. It's a good paper. The uh, this one, the IBM Power 7, is a very long, uh, detailed paper about how the Power 7 multi-core processor works, all the details are within there. So, you know, some of these are long, but, you know, basically if you're going to do the, it'll help you a lot if you actually understand the entire paper, all right? That's kind of the, one of the goals. And also a goal for giving you all this stuff way up in front of time. You can, you know, you can start reading these uh, anytime you have free time between now and when it's due. Um, okay, some of these dates will change as the, uh, time advances, there'll be some guest lectures I'm trying to organize as well. Um, last year, we had uh, Federico Fagan, who was one of the inventors of the microprocessor, did the first 4004 from Intel. He gave a guest lecture. Um, I'm going to look out for some good lecturers for this guest lectures this year as well, if I can find any. Um, okay. Um, so, yeah, so the, the second half, this is by the tentative dates for the midterm. So basically, the midterm will cover all the lecture material. Then after that, we kind of move into project mode, where um, you know the, the two during the two class times, we're going to um, divide up into, you know, depending on how many groups we have at that point, ten to fifteen minute slots, where we just meet one on one with that group, and you just have a you just have to show up for your slot during that class time. Um, and then uh, at the end, we'll have the uh, final project presentation somewhere in this week. Um, and the paper's due here. Okay. Um, so course info. So the... Oops. Why isn't that there? There we go. All right. So um, has a lot of information. Oh, yeah, textbook. So, you know, this is kind of the required for the class. <coughs> um, we don't actually have any readings assigned from there. This is, I think, a useful companion to the class. Um, it's not strictly necessary that you uh, get it and read it, but um, it has a lot of um, uh, information in there. Um, this is just the undergrad book in case you need to refresh your background on something. It's kind of a simple introduction to the concepts. Right? So I, I don't think you strictly need to buy the book. Um, it's a good book to buy, a good book to read, but it's not strictly necessary for the class. Right? We'll cover a lot of stuff in the lecture slides. Um, okay, and the Problem sets. Oh, here they are. Okay. So that's the link <laughs> where you submit. Okay. Let me make that a bit more. Uh, yeah, I think right. Okay. So I guess you go here and you fill out the. Uh, yeah. So this one's partly a survey. What's the last, last architecture class you took and where? Uh, what's the most complex processes you've implemented? Uh, are you ready to have a course project in mind and a partner? And also, so I just want you to go and look. The last part of this is really just go find a machine and tell me all the details about that machine, right? And, um, you know, this hopefully shouldn't take you too long, but some of these things might you have to do a bit of poking around. Part of this is to get you to find out how to find out about what's in your machines and also give you some, you know, real-world experience of what's actually out there, right? One, like for example, in your old prelim, a common question you might ask you is, so how much does a gigabyte of DRAM cost, right? Because we wanted you to know, well, how does that compare to a gigabyte of flash or a gigabyte of disk, right? If you don't know those numbers, you may get no clue why a machine's got so much of whatever. So, you know, the, you know, just understanding technology in terms of that technology translates into prices, right? How much silicon does it take to do this or that? How complex is the silicon? So, you know, getti getting some real world connection, it's not good to be an architect if you're completely devoid of any knowledge of how much things cost or how, you know, how things are actually built. So trying to get you connected to the real life here as well. Um, 
Okay. Yeah, I was going to, I didn't put it on the end, it might be too much. I was going to ask if you could figure out where your chip was manufactured and in which country it was manufactured. But I decided just to leave it at the foundry. I guess I did ask that, yeah. What foundry was it built in? Right, if you could figure that out. So this will involve some web searching, right? You may have to go find these things out for yourself. All right. Okay. Uh, right, so the problem sets will just appear like that on the, the website, and you just submit there. And also the reading summaries are going to be, um, I don't know if that link's up there already. Uh, yeah. Um, right. <laughs> 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 right, so we want to get your impression of the paper, right? So what do you think about it? Um, what did you like, what you didn't like? And uh, so we'll, we'll be showing these in class, so you shouldn't write things that you don't want me displaying like this on the screen in front of everybody else, because we'll use this to help see the, <laughs> see the discussion as well. So if you have some, you know, it's good to have some questions like, you know, I didn't understand what they meant by the ZYN module or whatever, you know, wha what was that? You can leave notes, comments like that, questions you want us to go over in the discussion. So the whole goal is, you know, during the course of the discussion to not just evaluate whether you read the paper, but to actually have everybody help each other understand what was in the paper, right? And, and I'll help hopefully, hopefully pull out what was, what everybody sees as the important things in that paper, right? And why, and also hopefully you know, give you enough context to understand why we assigned that paper in the first place. Sometimes you'd be like, why are we reading about this ancient machine, you know? Why is that important, right? And then you start talking to the architects who build all the machines you use, and they'll, they'll explain things in terms of that old machine, right? And I'll give you some idea of why, why we assign things that way. Okay. Uh, hopefully the dates for the midterm and um, the presentations and the paper should settle down in about a week or so. Um, th th it'll be somewhere around where they're, they're set, but not quite frozen yet. I'll try and freeze those soon. Yep? Are there any like, example projects from previous years? Um, yeah, unfortunately we're not usually allowed to post student projects because of the, the rules about uh, student privacy and stuff, but okay. I think there might be... Uh, what, oh, yes, I was going to, th what I haven't done yet, what I was going to do is put up uh, a set of project uh, ideas. Okay. Yeah, so, um, yes, yeah, so there's, uh, we have a few already, and we'll gather some more. So hopefully, yeah, by next week, we'll have a, actually, we, we could probably do that next week. I'll go over a list of kinds of things that might be projects. There's a, from the architecture research group, there's a whole bunch of things people would like somebody to go do <laughs> um, that might be interesting. Um, we'll put a bunch of those up, yeah. Uh, I right, already have a bunch of those. Yes, I should have done that for today. I forgot about that. Uh, if you want to you go deeper into something you've done already, that's fine. Also, if you're working on some, uh, one thing we like to do at Berkeley, if, you have s you know, if you're working in a research group and there's something you're doing there and you think there's some architecture angle in that work, that's good to do. We want you to, you know, it doesn't have to be completely divorced from stuff you're doing. In fact, it usually it's better if it's connected to something you're doing research-wise. Or if it's something you've done before and want to go deeper into it, that should be fine too, assuming it fits the other parameters of the, the project. Yeah. And the other thing to remember is, we want you to do things in pairs, um, and so you really have to persuade somebody else that it's a good idea <laughs> to go do this. That's part of the reason we do it in teams, you know. So, um, and between the two of you, you'll have to figure out, um, you know, division of labor and who's going to do what inside the project, obviously as well. Right. Um, but we'll be meeting with the groups one on one uh, later in the semester once the project gets going to help with that. Yeah. Well, there has to be clearly distinct lumps of work that are different that are done in both classes. But it can come from the same theme or a bit of infrastructure or something they have, but they should definitely have a architecture piece that has to be obviously a different chunk of work than the work chunk of work they did for the other class. I think probably in that case, I would like to see the report from the other class too. <laughs> so I get to see both reports. So to, to judge whether it's actually not just to change the course number on the, <laughs> the reports that you submit. Um, all right. Yeah. Okay. So the, the projects usually, you know, they, um, we say this every semester, and every semester it's usually people cram in the last few weeks when they do it, but it's, it's really worth, I, I think the important thing is to filter out bad ideas, bad infrastructure early on. So um, don't wait the last minute to find out that 
the sim that you're planning using doesn't actually support the feature you want to implement, <laughs> right? Um, try and get things going early. Uh, it's always my advice. And the other thing with uh, class projects, sometimes these do lead into papers. Usually it takes longer. Like the class project is enough to figure out this is interesting enough that it's worth pursuing further. And so then after the class, you can actually, you know, depending what you do next, go go work on it some more, maybe turn it into paper. Like my, when I did this class, when I was a Berkeley graduate student back a long time ago, um, yeah, the projects I did in the class ended up being a conference paper, but only after another year of work. <laughs> so, but we started in the class. Um, that's, that, that's something that's definitely possible. It's my favorite. Um, I'll have to take a look. Yeah, that's kind of tough. Well, my favorite machine is the Cray one, but I don't think the paper is the best paper about the Cray one. Um, there isn't a good single paper about the Cray one. This is the classic one that you'll always see when people cite the Cray one. I'd say that's my favorite machine, if not the favorite paper. The uh, probably the most impressive one is the 360 paper. I think um, just for when it was written and what they, like when you'll be reading right now, for when it was written and what, they basically came up with the idea of an ISA. So that's kind of a very powerful concept and just the, how far advanced they were in their thinking back then, is that's, I think that's the most impressive uh, of the papers. Um, and in terms of explaining everything inside the system, this Power 7 paper, you know, it's, you know, it, it's just, I, I like those kinds of papers, they tell you everything that goes on in the whole machine. Um, it's you know it's not the most exciting you know bedtime reading, <laughs> but it's uh, it has everything in there. So I appreciate when they take the uh, effort to actually write down the whole design. Um, so I appreciate that paper. Um, and this one on the design of display processes, it's very short, but has a lot of wisdom in. So this is a very good paper. It talks about the uh, wheel of reinc um, reincarnation. This is this is a great great short paper. That's great insight. Yeah, I'd say favorite machine, Cray one. Uh, most impressive paper is the, the, one, the one you're going to read next, just in terms of when it was and what they came out with. Um, yeah, but they're all, all pretty valuable. Like I said, th the idea of these is to be um, kind of must-read papers. Like if you do an architecture, you kind of need to know about this stuff. Um, and if you don't, you're going to have big holes, you know, and then you'll get into that problem of repeating history the bad way, right? And hopefully, and also the papers by themselves, um, what you learn is papers, as you go to conferences and talk to people, you realize that when you read the paper from some group, for example, it, it sort of is just one projection of all the things they did. And when you go talk to them, you learn about you know, so much more, like why they really did it, what didn't work, and you never hear about that in the paper, right? <laughs> all the stuff that failed, very rarely put in negative results. And the same with the papers, is they're just a projection of what those people were thinking. But in the discussion, hopefully, it can help bring out more of the context, the history, and what actually was going on at the time, business-wise as well. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. So papers are great, but there's there's much more to this industry than the, than the papers. Uh, this endeavor. So hopefully we bring that out as we go through the discussions. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. Let's finish early. So we'll start the actual material next time. So, okay. So remember the problem set is due. The simple problem set is due Sunday night, as well as the uh, first paper. Summaries, okay.